Uh, do we have our first slide? Okay, we do. Let me share the screen. Okay, that's good. Busy, busy. Let's go to. Oh, nice. There we go. All right. That's good. Mm. Okay, we're going to start with this. Okay, the title of this lecture is School of Paris. And um, it's going to center on three, really three painters, but there are a bunch of other artists involved in this group that will probably be just mentioned. The three artists we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about today, are principally uh, Chaim Soutin, who now you see before you in a self-portrait, and then the other will be Amedo Modigliani, and the third will be Marc Chagall, who everybody knows. Uh, the reason these people are brought together in Paris and the time in history that they were brought together are the things we're gonna go over. And it was kind of a renaissance this group of painters being in Paris for really kind of for 20th century Jewish painting and in a way for any kind of Jewish painting. Before this time, there's not a great tradition, although there are individuals in European art of Jewish painters. So this is kind of a little mini Renaissance explosion of Jewish painters who come on the scene right before and right after the First World War. Next slide. There's, a, there's an arrow running around here, but I don't know why. Okay, we can help me ignore that. This is um, Montmartre, and it's a place in Paris that you can visit now. And it is a mont, it is a hill, and it is part of Paris, and you're on the hill, and Sacré-Cœur, the big cathedral, is at the top, and it's the one place that it's, it's very known in France and across the world as being this sort of you know, artsy, arty place. And that dates back to this time, really in the middle of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, when it became a place where a lot of artists had studios, Renoir, uh, uh, later on Matisse, later on Modigliani actually, oh, and happened? a bunch of- what, Why do you think you couldn't find the fucking email? I don't know why, but I well, couldn't. I, dead, dead, I went painters. I uh, went back. Someone's to not on thing. mute. You know what? Uh, can, you, can the host please mute everybody? Yes. I, Thank you. Well, it's, that's that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank okay. you. <laughs> anyway, the, the reason I brought up Montmartre is Montmartre is a place where all these artists had studios. And you it was very important and it's seen a lot in- Search on Kahila Hanahar, that's seen, all. It's seen a lot in uh, uh, impressionist paintings and outdoor scenes by painted by Renoir and other painters. They proceed into the 20th century, you have people like Picasso and Braque at the Bateau, a place called the Bateau Lavoie, sent me a direct message. which, is this, which yeah. is this big studio area, very bohemian, no heat, where everybody's painting, everybody's getting together. But what's being hap what's happening then is a great explosion in painting in France. And it, it's an amazing period because you're having people like Matisse and Picasso and all these people coming to Paris, starting a whole new types of painting all at once. This, what we have here in the slide is a very famous Matisse that went to the uh, Salon des Indépendants, the independent salon, and caused a furor. Nobody had ever seen a painting like this done with such direct colors. Actually, Matisse painted the painting a couple of days before he exhibited it, because it was a substitute for a painting of his that was much more worked out, which he was not very fond of in the end. So he painted this painting very quickly, very much a reaction to his, his wife sitting there, and caused a furor. May have caused a furor, but it was also bought by Sarah Stein, who was the sister-in-law of Gertrude Stein. And so in rapid order, it got known by a lot of people. Next slide. Next. Then starts the pilgrimage. The pilgrimage from Montmartre to Montparnasse. 
And this is where all the, the whole heart of this French school, the School of Paris, really starts in this neighborhood, this area of Paris, Montparnasse. I know many of people have been to Paris and have walked around this area. It's an area that starts pretty much close to like where the, where the uh, Notre Dame is and spreads out all on the left bank. It is characterized principally by these huge long boulevards that are a very open area. You can see them in this slide that these areas are popular by a lot of people. This is a slide from that period in the 20s. And you can see that this famous cafe, Café de Dôme, where people sat out and could eat and drink and, and hang around. And these were places, the Café de Dôme, the Rotonde, the, uh, 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 La Coupole. These were places where artists went and they could sit around all day. They even in the Rotonde could trade artwork for meals, for drinks. And this became a very social hotbed. I want to point out now that my father and my, both my parents experienced this period in Paris themselves. My mother was studying and it was in the ballet at that time, the ballet russe. And my father was starting out as being, who had started out as a painter, was now turning to becoming an art dealer. And he was meeting very many artists there. And he told me that when he was young at that time and in Paris, he could walk down the street and look into the dome and look across the street to Rotonde, all these cafes. And he would see sitting outside Picasso and James Joyce and F. Scott Fitzgerald and all these people were very accessible. They were sitting right on the corner and they would spend their days a lot of time socializing in these places. Next slide. Next. Now we're going to turn our attention to Amadeo Modigliani. Can we go back to the last one? The one before? Previous slide? Previous slide? Anyway, I'm having a hard time. OK, we'll stay on this. Where was just a photograph of Modigliani? Modigliani is born in Livorno in Italy. He's his parents were both pretty radical anarchists, very educated people, very liberal-minded people. Not very good with money, but very open. He had a very good education. He grew up in Italy. He spent time in Venice as a young man. He started drawing, and he was a very precocious artist. He was very talented, and he was regarded as that. People recognized that in him. But he was also a man when a young age, when he was a little boy, who contracted tuberculosis. So he was an ill man or not in very good health all his life. He was never a man who looked after his health, that I would have to say, but he was ill from start of his life. This is an early portrait before you that he painted when he was in Paris, because he got to Paris in 1906, which is also an important year because it's the year that Cezanne dies, which is a dramatic thing, and you're getting big retrospectives in Paris of people like the huge Cezanne retrospective, which is very, very important for a lot of painters. And you're also getting retrospectives and shows of people like Van Gogh, who nobody really had ever seen Van Gogh's paintings in great numbers. It was actually Matisse who hung the Van Gogh show, the first big Van Gogh show. The Gauguin show of retrospective was around that time. All these painters that, that, that were People discovered round this exactly at the same moment, and it influenced everybody. Painting was on the cutting edge. Painting was like the Grammys tonight. You're gonna have the Grammys. Well, painting was the cool thing to do. And it was also, it was like rock and roll. People were drawn to it, and it, it, people had discussions and arguments about it all the time. Anyway, this is a, an early painting of Modigliani that I wanted to show you because it's, it looks like kind of a looser Klimt in some ways but it's not characteristic of his later style. And you can see his choice of that style later on is a choice. And it was made for reasons that he, he thought were aesthetic and important to him and for his voice. Let's have the next slide. Okay. 
Okay, that next slide is on the left, you can see Modigliani. And in the middle is a man, get my cat down. In the middle is, the, is a man that everybody knows. It's Picasso. And on Picasso's left is André Salmon, who was a poet and also art critic, quite well known, who lived quite into, into like the until 1969. You can see here that a, a couple of things about Modigliani. Like Picasso, they're short people, but Modigliani is quite a handsome man. He was kind of, and known very much in his time as kind of a chick magnet. He was a very a man of great dissipation. He was an alcoholic. He smoked hashish all the time. He never had any money. He kind of depended on handouts from people. And he sort of drifted around. He would do drawings in these cafes of people just to get a meal. And he, so he was a very kind of your arch typical bohemian type, kind of, you know, a very famous kind of character like that. He also got some stipends and money from various collectors who then would get a certain amount of his output in painting in return. But uh, it was never mu that much to live on. And he was always at the mercy of, you know, starvation pretty much. Next slide. This is a later painting of his where, he, where it can show you how his style developed and became a much more, you know, reduced kind of abbreviated style, which he was famous for. This is a portrait of, that he painted of Picasso and quite an interesting painting. Shows a little the influence of, of Picasso's work too and of cubism and of simplifying things. Next slide. So these people are, 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 are Modigliani and his group and all, this, all these um, bohemian types are living in Montparnasse. And where does the name Montparnasse come from? Montparnasse is Mount Parnassus. So it, it was sort of like the mountain where the gods in Greek times were, were living. And so it was, it was, there was no, there was a reason why it was called this. First of all, probably because it's very close to where all the university is. And, and, where, and it was also because it was the hotbed. It was this very exciting time and place for people to live. And people, as I say, would go to these, here's La Coupole, which is a famous, uh, uh, um, another one of those famous restaurants, Brasseries, where people could sit outside and see people. And I'd like to point out that when I was a young boy in Paris with my father, probably when I was around 12, I was sitting outside of this very restaurant when a man walked by from the street and my father called over to him and he said, Osip, it was Osip Zadkin, who was, also, was a sculptor, a Jewish sculptor, also a Parisian French person, who was part of this group, School of Paris. And it, I can point out to you, even that time in the 60s, the, the remaining artists who survived would frequent these same brasseries and places where they grew up. And that's kind of an amazing thing. So it was an ongoing thing. And if you went to La Coupole, there was a section of La Coupole which was divided for people who wanted to have like a, a you know white tablecloth and a real meal. And the other part that was pretty much for the, you know, the poor artists who couldn't get a sandwich or something. Next slide. We're gonna run through these. Here's La Rotonde, this is the other famous one that's still around. And where actually Modigliani and, and Picasso used to hang out the most. And what's the next one? And here's the dome. That's the third. So that's a very famous place. It was more literary people at the dome than at the other two. Next slide. This is the interior of La Coupole with its way it was division, divided. And that came into operation in the 20s. more than, And it was mostly known also as a seafood restaurant. Next slide. So Modigliani is not really having that much success with his paintings. He's selling some, but he's struggling. And all of a sudden in 1905, he decides, I would really like to more, I'm more, I'm more interested in being a sculptor than a painter. And this was also instigated by a neighbor of his, which is Constantine Brancusi, who is pictured here. Very famous sculptor, still today. And if you, if you look at, at, at uh, Modigliani's sculpture, you can see that, the, that it's very influenced from Brancusi. 
and it's very reduced and very to bare essentials and very schematized. Next slide. Here's one of Modigliani's sculptures. Now Modigliani believed, first of all, that true sculpture had to be carved. He didn't believe in modeled, in modeling clay or, or, or modeling a wax and, and then, you know, uh, casting it. He believed that it had to be carved to really be sculpture. And he got a stone really from finding it on the street and finding discarded pieces of stone. In fact, he carved pieces outside, on site, which he couldn't even move. He had to leave it there because it was too heavy for him to move. Next slide. Modigliani, he, I, he was also very famous as a draftsman. This is a drawing he did of a caryatide. That's a type of stand, of like a classical pose of like a, um, he did also in a sculpture. It's supposed to hold up a column, hold up a building. It's an architectural uh, sculpture that's supposed to be included in architecture. Next slide. Modigliani was a great lover of Cezanne. And the reason I'm showing this slide too is because you can see in Cezanne, there are, are parts in the Cezanne which today to our eyes look distorted or like you can see this young boy's arm is a little long. It balances the painting. It res you respond to how you see, but it's very much something that influenced the style of people like Modigliani later on. In fact, Modigliani would walk around by the reproduction of this painting and kiss it once in a while. He was so in love with this painting, which is a great painting. Next slide. Now we get to the mature Modigliani. The attorney with the long neck, the very reduced, you know, detail, not much detail in the face, very sculptural in a way. Influenced also by think, things like Cycladic sculpture from, you know, Greece, you know, primitive sculpture. And it was something that didn't catch on right away, although it made an effect. He was showing it at the Independent, the, 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 the salons. So people were seeing his work. He still couldn't sell it, but he was very, very, he was very, he was known by everybody. Next slide. So in 1915, this gentleman gets to Paris. We're gonna switch now to Chaim Soutine. Soutine was born in Shlomninsky in, in, in Russia. He was the son of a tailor, a very poor tailor, and he was a part of a family of, he was part of 11, he was one of 11 children. When he was a very young boy, he was, started drawing and painting on his own, no training. And he painted a portrait of the rabbi in his community. For Orthodox rabbi, and the rabbi's son took issue to this. And he came and he beat young Chaim up badly. And so Soutine's parents brought a suit against the rabbi's family and won some money. And with that money, Soutine got out of Shlomo Rinsky. <laughs> and in the end, Kate got together with a bunch of other friends, Constante Kramegi, and, and Kissling, these other painters who later on also would go to Paris, and they studied in Vilnius. They studied painting first, but they really weren't getting that much out of being in, in, in the art school, and they wanted to get to Paris because everybody knew Paris was the hot place to be if you're a painter. So um, Soutin goes to Paris with his friends on very little money, and he arrives in Paris with hardly anything in his pocket. But when he gets to Paris, he's lucky because, next slide, next slide, there's a place to stay. And there's a, this place is still there in Paris and it's called La Ruche. And now La Ruche is a very interesting place because it was built for the Salon, I, I, I mean, no, for the International Exhibition in 1900 in Paris. And it was left there. And a sculptor, this uh, Alfred Boucher bought it because he wanted to help have a place, cheap place where artists and painters could live. It wasn't heated, it was a mess, it was full of bugs, but it was a place where they could stay and have studios. 
So this place was divided into all these studios. And people who had stayed, who at one time were in that place, were people like Diego Rivera, uh, uh, Soutin, Chagall, Lipschitz, all these people lived there and, and at one time or another and worked there. And it's in this place that uh, uh, Soutin meets Modigliani. And the person who introduces them is Jacques Lipschitz, the sculptor. And right away, they get along. First of all, Modigliani really thinks that Soutine is a great painter, even at this early stage. And they become very close together. And they're also big drinking buddies and carousing buddies. Next slide, please. This is a very early Soutine when he, painting that he did when he came to Paris. And what this painting uh, uh, paints is another studio where both Soutine and Modigliani moved quickly. And it wasn't that much nicer a place, but it's also in Montparnasse, and that's in Cité Falguerre. That's a part of Montparnasse. Next slide. And this still remains. There's the studio. It still remains there in Paris to this day. And just as a memory, you know, it's a memory of what used to be in that section of Paris. Next slide. When they get together, 1915, this is during the war, during the First World War. And Modigliani know, gets to know a man called Leopold Sporovsky. This is Modigliani's, one of Modigliani's many portraits of Sporovsky. And Sporovsky is an art dealer. And he gives uh, Modigliani a stipend. So Modigliani can survive from and Sporovsky gets his paintings to sell. They don't really sell that much, but Sporovsky believes in Modigliani. And Sporovsky doesn't really like Soutine that much or think that much of his paintings, but Modigliani kind of pushes him to take Soutine on too. And this is a very dramatic moment for both of them because now they can actually survive in a way. I mean, they still don't have much money, but they can survive and keep painting. And Sporovsky also produced, you know, procures, you know, paints and canvases for these people. One thing to, which is very interesting is that both Modigliani and Soutine tend to paint on used canvases. Soutine especially would go to like the flea market and get other, like they would sell tons and tons of paintings that nobody wanted, and he would paint over them. A lot of Soutine's paintings are painted on top of other paintings. Next slide. The other thing uh, uh, Sporovsky does is he pushes Modigliani to paint nudes. Now, this probably didn't really help Modigliani out that much, but these are the paintings that today are worth huge amounts of money. And this one was sold for, I don't know, $70 million recently or something like that. They're also paintings that, that really established Modigliani's reputation in Paris in another way. He gets his first one-person show at this Berth Wiles gallery. She was an art dealer who also had shown Matisse earlier on, but she gives him a show of these nudes. And the show is closed down because a, a policeman walks by and looks in the window, and next slide, and he sees paintings like this. And he's scandalized. Why is he scandalized? He scandalized show and closes the show, not because these are nudes. They'd show nudes, the classical, you know, academic nudes. No, but these nudes have body hair. It's hard to find the body hair, but they have body hair. And this, incidentally, for Paris was a scandal. You never know what's going to get you thrown out. <laughs> Next slide. So this is the First World War. Sporovsky gets Modigliani and Soutine and ships them off to south of France. Getting out of trouble, whatever. But there in the south of France, Modigliani is not a landscape painter. If you go to the Barnes collection, you probably can see there's one landscape there that he did in the south of France. And then he went right away back to Paris, where he was more comfortable. But Soutine stayed in the south of France and started really to paint the paintings he's most famous for. And these are these incredible explosions of color and paint that are, are, are of 
they are done on site. They're done from subject. This is Kanya. Is every, anybody who knows who's ever been in Kanya? Kanya is on a hillside. It's overlooking the Mediterranean, an old, like medieval town, beautiful place. But this explodes for Soutine into what he sees it. It's kind of a liquid architecture. And the thing to remember about this is now people are characterized as, as expressionist, but really, I think it's more expressive than expressionist. And it's also a painting that's done very quickly, very energetically, and obviously an emotional reaction to a situation, but it has an intense architecture also and will influence other artists later on because of that. Next slide. That said, they are pretty crazy paintings. They're very wild, they're very all over the place. It seems like inanimate objects are alive. And there are people who write about Sutin and they go, I don't know, there's nothing particularly, and the critics say, well, there's nothing particularly Jewish about Sutin. And I kind of go against that opinion. Sutin is coming from a background of Hasidism, of ecstatic dancing, feeling of oneness with nature, animation of nature, God in everything, everything being extremely alive. I mean, I think these paintings are pretty much like that. I mean, if there was such a thing as really Hasidic painting, I think this is it. Next slide. So Soutin is in this part of, after he's in Cain, he goes to Serre. Serre is a place that's closer to the Spanish border. And he starts painting a whole bunch of paintings like this. that are really liquefied. I mean, they are the most extreme paintings he painted, painted in his life. They also are paintings that later in his life, he tried to disown, which proves something that's very true about a lot of artists. Artists don't necessarily, aren't exactly necessarily the best critics of their own work. And to us, these are like the prime soutines. And I will point out that we are very fortunate for where we live, I mean, in Kelly Kehila Tanahar, because anybody who lives in our, our area, other people are looking at this talk, they're very close to, to collections. You can see collections where you can see a lot of soutines. You can go to the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia, and especially you can go to the museum in Princeton that has a huge collection, including the self-portrait of soutine, and you can see a lot of really top-level soutines of this period, of the Serre period. Next slide. Now I'm going to switch back to Paris. Soutine is still in the south of France, and, but Morigliani is in Paris. And his situation is getting worse. His health is much worse. He's very, very ill, gravely ill. And this painting I'm showing you here is a portrait he paints of his then common law wife, and, 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 and Jeanne Hebutin. She was disowned by her family for really getting together with Soutine. No, not Soutine, Modigliani. I'm getting mixed up. Modigliani. And, but he, she became, and they had a very tempestuous relationship. Modigliani always had tempestuous relationships. He even had a relationship with Anna Akhmatova, the famous uh, Russian poet. But that also ended you know, in an explosion. He paints Jean many times. And his paintings are starting to get recognition. There's a show in London. He's starting to be written about by, you know, people who are involved in the art world and interested in modernism. It's, it comes too late. He's very ill. His tuberculosis comes back. He's drinking heavily. And he dies. And sadly, John kills herself very shortly thereafter. So it's a very sad end to Modigliani. He was kind of this flame of bohemian guy who very quickly burnt out. Soutine is still in the south of France. He doesn't even come back for his friend's funeral. But shortly thereafter, he does get back to Paris. Next slide. And he starts painting portraits. And this is a significant painting because this painting is in the Barnes Collection. If you go to Philadelphia, it's in the Barnes Collection. And if you'll notice on the left, this young gentleman, this pastry chef, this little pastry cook, 
has a very large ear. And it was that ear that made Soutine's life good, that brought fortune to Soutine. Because Mr. Barnes, next slide. Here's Albert Barnes in the Barnes Collection in Marion. Well, Albert Barnes, this, on his second trip to Paris, this is 1922, sees that painting of the little pastry chef with the ear. Now Barnes had been to Paris before and he had bought, he had bought, he bought a huge amount of paintings. In fact, there was a, a small little uh, uh, publication in Montparnasse that would announce when Barnes was coming. Barnes is coming, Barnes is coming because everybody got excited because <laughs> they knew they could, they could sell some paintings because he bought paintings by the batches, batches of paintings. In fact, this is a true story. My father was in Paris at this time, in the 20s, after, after the First World War. He had served, my father had served in the army in, in Austria, but he finally made his way to Paris and he got to know Soutine really well. And he, they were, he will attest to the fact that Soutine was pretty much as wild as they make out. He was a guy who, Soutine was a guy, let's put it this way, he, cleanliness wasn't his great suit. In fact, when he got some money, he would buy a suit and he would wear it constantly, sleep in it. And when the suit got really dirty and moldy and whatever, he'd just throw it out and buy another suit. Um, he was a kind of wild guy. And they went carousing together, my father and Soutine and a bunch of other people. In fact, they were at Leopold Sporovsky, Soutine's dealer, uh, his gallery, when Sporovsky came up to Sutina, my father, he said, gave him some money and said, get out of here, go have lunch. Barnes is coming. I don't want him to see you guys. If he sees you guys, he's going to say, oh boy, look at these crazy people I'm dealing with. So I, let me talk to him first alone. And that's when Barnes saw that painting with, that, with ear. And Barnes ends up buying 50 Soutines. He didn't keep them all over the years. He sold them off quite a few, but... He also kept a bunch of them. And the story goes that when Sutin got his money from Sporowski for these purchase of these paintings, or at least the first payment, Sutin went into the street and hailed a cab in Paris and he said, take me to the south of France. And the cab drove 400 miles to take him to the south of France. And that's the kind of guy he was pretty much. But so Sutin makes, this changes everything for Sutin. Up until the end of his life, Soutine, although he's, you know, he's not the guy who looks after his money very well, he still always had money. He had people who would buy his paintings. And in fact, my, fa my father was the person who introduced Soutine to older painters like Villar and Bonnard, who were better known in France. And they recognized, even those painters who paint in a very different manner, recognized the talent of Soutine. The talent with color, the talent with paint, they could see it right away. Next slide. The thing about it, this is a great Chardin painting, which is in the Louvre. And I wanted to mention that the thing about Soutine that is kind of maybe contradictory is he might be this wild man, but he loves old masters. His great painters for him are not Van Gogh, are not Cezanne. We thought, he thought they were old maids. The painters he loved were Rembrandt, principally, Chardin, Courbet, Coro. And in fact, he loved those painters so much, sometimes he would make versions of their paintings. Next slide. And this is Soutine's version of the Chardin, the Ray. A little wilder, I would say, but still keeping a feeling of it, a feeling of the past painting. Next slide. Now we get to the most famous group of paintings, which were influenced by an old master that Soutine painted. And these are the paintings he painted of the big piece of beef, the side of beef. They were influenced by this painting by Rembrandt, which is actually a kind of small painting in the Louvre. But it's a very important painting because it also relates to a famous Baudelaire poem called La Charogne, the rotting piece of meat. 
What these, that poem proves and what this painting proves is subject matter isn't that important. It's how you use language or how you use the language of paint to describe it. That, this is a great painting and it's beautiful, even though it's of a piece of meat. And this painting influenced Soutine to get his big carcass. Next slide. Next, and start painting these huge paintings of carcasses, which are probably some of his fam most famous paintings. He hired a studio just for that. He hung the, the, the carcass up. He had a young woman assistant get uh, a, a vats of blood from all these butchers to keep it moist. But after a while, while he's painting this carcass, it's starting to smell a little. So the neighbors are calling the police and they call the police in. And the police come in and say, wait a minute, this really stinks around here. But it being France, and there being no facial hair involved <laughs> or body hair, the policeman comes up to Sutin and he says, hey, wait a minute, you're painting these, you're making paintings of these. You know, you can inject them with these different chemicals and you can get rid of the stink. So the cop helps out Sutina and he keeps the, the beef and he keeps painting. Next slide. And he paints a whole series of these. And they're really some more flattened like this, some more modernist, some having more depth. But they become very, very big things that make Sutin's reputation. Next slide. Soutin also painted a lot of still lives. His still lives, as you can see here, are very animated. Nothing like his landscapes. Inanimate objects are animated. Those, you know, forks look very alive to me. In fact, they look more alive than the rabbits. He keeps making still lives when he can't paint uh, uh, portraits or he can't paint uh, uh, landscapes. Next slide. Here's another one from that beef series, which is more, in a way, more traditional. Next slide. So Sitin is also painting portraits. And he paints portraits like the little uh, 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 guy who's the little pastry chef. He paints portraits also of working people. Like this guy's a bellhop. Next slide. And this lady is a secretary. This little painting is beautiful. It was probably painted very quickly. It's in the Phillips collection. And it happens to be the secretary of my father. This was my father's secretary when he was in Paris. And Soutine came up to my father and said, would you ask your secretary if I could paint her? And my father said, why don't you ask her? <laughs> so he did, and he painted this very quick little painting which is now in the Phillips. Quite a beautiful painting. Next slide. This is my father. Is a photograph of my father in his one gallery, open gallery ever had in Cologne in the 20s in, in, in Germany. And uh, he, one of the first shows he ever had in that gallery was not of Soutine, but it was of Chagall. And next slide. Now we're going to go over for a second to this third artist, Chagall, and talk a little about him. Chagall is much better known than Soutine in America and internationally. In fact, he's one, probably the most internationally well-known Jewish painter. And when Chagall used to complain to my father later in his life, oh, I don't have any money, oh, this is... My father said, until every Jew in the world has a painting of yours, you've got a, you, you got a built-in clientele. <laughs> but Chagall was a guy who loved to complain. I will attest to that fact. And he was also much more of a person who was involved with his career. He was very much a guy who, who very much wanted to get ahead. Not that that's a bad thing. Matisse was like that, Picasso was like that, but people like Soutin or Modigliani were not like that. Now I'm gonna go through a couple of paintings of really the major Chagalls, the Chagalls that really built his whole reputation. Next. 
beautiful painting, colorful paintings that were painted in Paris early on. These are all, this painting is pre-First World War. See what happened to Chagall was he got to Paris earlier than both Modigliani and, and Soutine. And he was living at La Ruche and he was painting. He had no money, but he was also very good friends with people like Robert Delaunay, who was a great influence on this painting, and Matisse and those people. And he's starting to get shown. He's also starting to get known very much in Paris. Next slide. A painting like this, which is very famous, the Fiddler, like Fiddler on the Roof, is painted really on a tablecloth. You didn't have the money for a canvas to do this, but it's an iconic painting and defined his style, which pretty much he kept for all his life. Chagall never, never really changed his style. It was a style that was really discovered on his own. In fact, when surrealism started to happen, Andre Breton was the head of the surrealists, really wanted Chagall to join the surrealists because you're telling fantastic stories. You, you, you know, he, he thought it was, they were very akin to surrealism. But Chagall said no. You know, he, to Chagall, these stories are stories of his childhood. And they're, they're not so much you know, dreams as they are fantastic relations of, of, of a narrative story told in a very plas different plastic, modern plastic means. Next slide, which include cubism, modern ideas like that. Those are all incorporated. And this playful kind of style of Chagall remains with him all his life, as I said before, and leads to paintings like the next one, a very famous painting, a painting also my father used to own at one time that was also exhibited in, in, in Germany at the time. It was one of the reasons that my father really had, was, was in peril when he was in and had to leave Europe. Uh, having a, a Chagall show in Germany right before when Hitler was coming in was not the best idea in a way. You got very well known as a Jewish dealer and as a Jew showing modern art. Two things the Nazis didn't like, Jews and modern art. So my father later on went to Paris I mean, during his time in the 20s. And but when he, the reason he left Europe is because he got word from a, a, a friend he had in the English, English embassy who said, when he saw the list and he said, when the Germans come in to Paris, you're on the list, they're gonna arrest you immediately. So, but my father got out, which was a very, good thing, um, and he got out in time. Next slide. Of course, Chicago had a long career, went on to doing, doing a lot of stained glass windows like these that are now, you know, outside of Jerusalem, this whole series of windows. And you can see them. Biblical themes, he's very well known for that. He has a whole museums in the south of France. He went back to live in the south of France. And as a young man, as a young boy, I met him there with my father at the end of his life. But he was very productive and remained productive and popular till the end of his life. Going back to Paris, next slide. The situation in Paris before the Second World War is very dire for Jews. You had all these Jewish painters in Paris. Some people liked them, some people didn't. Some people hated them purely because they were Jewish. And it was called the style. The style that, that, that Soutin has, this painterly, very aggressive style with paints, with material that's not, you know, it's not contained in lines, it's not classical. That was regarded as decadent and Jewish. And if you were a painter like even Morandi, when he painted with thick paint in Italy, the, he was criticized for painting in a Jewish way. It was very interesting. It was kind of assumed that that was like kind of a decadent thing and a dirty kind of thing. This photograph is a man called Leon Blum. Leon Blum, the irony is, while there was rampant anti-Semitism in Paris in the 20s and 30s, Paris actually elected its only first and to date only Jewish president at that time. And this is Leon Blum, who was a very leftist leader, who was a very supported by unions, 
But there still was, it was a very hard time in Paris for Jews. He even was nearly killed by a mob at one time, but survived that and remained in, in France, but lost his, his presidency quite, he was only president for about two or three years. So Paris is a very contentious place for Jewish painters. In a way, a lot of them got out. Chagall gets out, he goes to, through Spain and gets eventually out of France, through Spain with the help of the State Department, United States State Department and gets to New York City. Uh, Osip Zadkin gets out, Jack Lipschitz gets out, a lot of people do. Next slide. This is Leon Blum's brother, painted by VR, René Blum. The reason I put him in here is because he was, his principal contribution is really not a painterly one, but he was the head of the Ballet Ristamonte called the ballet that my mother was in. So my mother knew him and said he was a very decent man. Now, Leon Blum actually went with the ballet to America, but came back to France right before the war, which was a very bad mistake for him, in that he died at Auschwitz. He was deported. <laughs> His brother, Leon Blum, went to Buchenwald, but survived the war. Next slide. So what happens to Soutine? Well, my brother, my father always told me that he, my father tried to convince Soutine, but this is in 39. This is, you know, very early on. And he's trying to convince Soutine to leave France. In fact, my father always said he had a ticket for him on the boat, but in the end, Soutine said, I can't leave France. I don't know English. I can hardly speak French. I mean, the most of the time that my father spoke with Soutine, they spoke a Yiddish together. Uh, so he, Soutine, in the end, does not leave France. And that also is a bad decision for him. All his life, Soutine suffered from ulcers, bad stomach, which he aggravated terribly by drinking too much, carousing too much, staying up late, not really looking after himself. So he was in a very bad health, too. He got out of Paris. He's hidden by a lot of friends and people who care about him. He's hidden in a small town out south of Paris, not far from here. He paints paintings of here. This is Chartres Cathedral, painted by Soutine in, those period, in that period. He's even sheltered by the mayor of the small town, who knows that he's Jewish, who, do, who doesn't force him to wear a yellow star and all this stuff. But the problem was Soutine's health was too bad. And in the end, mm -hmm. He needed an operation for his ulcer. And he was taken to Paris and he dies in 1943 on the operating table. It's a sad end. And with that end is the end of the School of Paris. Although some, as you can see, Chagall survived. People like Lipschitz survived. Zadkin keeps making paintings. But that whole period comes to an end. But it's a period that had a lot especially with Soutine, had a great influence on other painters. Next slide. Ooh. At this period, this is a, a de Kooning painting. Willem de Kooning, famous abstract expressionist. And actually, as we speak, there is a show now, which I encourage people to go see, at the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia of Soutine and de Kooning. Because they are so, de Kooning was so, influenced by Soutine, they decided to have the show where they compare and contrast the painters with different paintings. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't work. But with, 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 I would like to see the one with de Kooning because it is interesting. And de Kooning used to always say an interesting thing about Soutine. He said, Soutine liquefied Cezanne. And it's a funny way of looking at it, but in some ways, there's some truth in that. Next painting. Another painter influenced very much by Soutine and is Francis Bacon, who admitted that. All the other painters of what would be called the London School, Frank Auerbach, Leon Kossoff, they were also very influenced by Soutine and loved Soutine's paintings. Soutine is much, paintings are much better recognized in Europe than they are in America to this day. They fetch better prices too. Next slide. Even somebody like Wayne Thiebaud, 
paints in a very different manner, a hundred years strong and still painting in California, uh, loves Soutine's paintings. And I brought him up here because I wanted to show that he said, Thibault said a very interesting thing about Soutine's painting. Most people look at Soutine's paintings and say, oh, it's all this paint just being thrown around. Thibault pointed out that that kind of painting, first throw painting, very quickly done with a paintbrush, it's actually some of the most precise painting you can paint because anything, you can't revise anything. It's done very much in one go, very much like Van Gogh did. That kind of painting takes huge discipline. And it was in the, in, and I think that's very true. I'm gonna end with this next slide. And it's oh, of a painter, very few people know, Constante Cremege, Pincus Cremege. Now Pincus Cremege was a friend of Soutine, childhood friend, went to paint with him in the south of France when he went there, but stayed, stayed in the south of France, survived the Second World War, never, get that, never got that very famous, went to Israel, came back and to, to France and died in France. And I like this painting and I wanted to show also a painting which is not by maybe that a well-known a painter and showed us this quality that came out of that school of painting for nearly a lot of painters, including myself. That comes to the conclusion of my part of the talk. And if there are any questions, I am happy to answer them. Why don't you unmute when you want to ask a question? Andrea, I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, you know, there, there's kind of a, a persistent strain of anti-Semitism in France. And uh, I, I was wondering what, how the, the, uh, the artists of, of Jewish faith, uh, whether there are any issues between them and artists that were not of Jewish faith. Was there any tension there? Good question. Very good question. As we know, especially in the time of the Dreyfus Affair, which coincided with the Impressionist group, it literally broke up the Impressionist group because Renoir and Degas, Degas was a violent anti-Semite. And Renoir was a sort of more passive, but pretty much an anti-Semite too. And, and ironically, a lot of their patrons were Jews who bought their paintings. So they did very, it was a very ambiguous situation. And actually, Modigliani visited Renoir, and Renoir helped Modigliani out financially at one time. So it's, it's an ambiguous situation. But there was breakup, and, and certain painters were violently anti-Semitic and, and really did even you know, write about against Jewish painting and, and, and said people like Soutine were decadents and all this kind of stuff. So there was rupture, but then there was, it was, there was also not. And there were people like Pissarro who ended up being, you know, loved by Cezanne, as he said, it was like he was like Moses to him. And yet Cezanne was against Dreyfus. So, you know, it's a complicated situation. But we have to remember Pat France to this day is the European country with the greatest amount of Jews in Europe. It is. And it, it's kind of embedded in the situation. Although I will say in France, you know, you know, if they like you and you're Jewish, you're an Hebrew, like a Hebrew. And if they don't like you, they're sal juif, you know, <laughs> a Jew. So it's a very, it's to this day, it's a dicey situation in France, it is. Judy wants to ask something. I just wanted to ask what the next to the last um, slide, mm -hmm. I didn't hear who, whose painting was that? The blue the Wayne Thibo. Wayne Thiebaud, he's like mostly known in America for painting these, you know, uh, ice cream cones and, and desserts and very, very painterly painter. He's a West Coast painter. He was a friend of Richard Diebenkorn. And he is, he's, he's over a hundred, he keeps painting. He's a great painter. It's really good. He's an interesting painter. He's a very interesting yeah. painter. Thanks. Anybody else? Have you seen the show at the Barnes? No, I have not. I have not. I will. I will end up going there. Yeah, I'd like to see it actually. 
I was just wondering how it compares to the show that was at the Jewish Museum of Kitu. Oh, I don't know. That's true. There was one. I know. They also, you know, it's Jewish Museum. I didn't see that one, but they also had, they also, Jewish Museum did a show of Modigliani. They've been very, you know, they've had quite a few shows. In fact, Soutine is, is being shown. Soutine ends up being what, what painters would call a painter's painter. You know, there's a bunch of them. There's, you know, um, uh, Morandi, uh, Devoncourt. Some are better, you know, more popular with other people, but they end up being a, a painter like Chardin. is a painter that very few people know of, but is adored by painters and very, very influential to the whole history of painting. So maybe Soutine will end up being that kind of painter. You know, who knows? Because tastes, but tastes, you know, are... It's crazy how tastes come and go. They really can, can shift overnight. You know. Well, it, to me, it's a very hard road to, to a line to, to cross. Is that the work is very good, but it's very hard to live with. <laughs> Maybe it's, that might be true. That is true. It's sort of like a big explosion on the wall. But it's funny what you get used to. I have some really abstract paintings of mine. It's, I live with them. <laughs> and some other people do. In fact, the, the one painting I have in a major collection is in, in that university, Dennis knows this, south of you in, in, in Jersey, there's a, I forget the name of the school. It's next to Lawrenceville. They have a painting of mine that's very colorful. And, and some people, it's really funny how people react to paintings. But because that painting to me is like, uh, I really labored hard over it, but people look at it and go, oh, it's so joyful. You know, it's like, you know. and I, my thing is the viewer is always right. I mean, the painter, the artist is the person who does the work, but the person who enjoys it are the viewers. It's like, I love the quote of Henry James the novelist said, Somebody said, asked him his opinion of his books. He said, I write the things. I don't have to read them, too. <laughs> Except that you educate the viewer. Viewers yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, I, I'm being, you know, obvious. Uh, Andre, but, say, but uh, Andre a Abraham, mm -hmm. I, I, first of all, I'm, I'm really yeah. stunned by how much you know, I didn't know, but but more importantly, we can all read books and look at videos and stuff like this. I get the feeling that this is so firsthand, like you and I are sitting in a Paris sidewalk cafe hearing the stories in time. Yes. No, thank you. Well, that's really, thank you for bringing that up because that's really what I like to convey. I'm like one of the last vehicles, I mean, uh, and it's a great opportunity to, 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 to share this because it's good to know these, these are real people. You know, they weren't, they, they become, in history, they all become, you know, like names and they, they don't breathe, but they were regular people. I mean, you know, and they had opinions and, you know, they were, they were funny, you know, they made jokes, you know, they, they, were, they were very funny people, you know. My father once took VR and Bonar he went with Vian Bonnard in Paris to go see um, Leopold Stokowski conduct an orchestra. And they, they, in the middle of the Beethoven, I don't know what Beethoven symphony was conducting, they walked out. So my father followed them and, they say, and he said, my father said to them, why did you walk out? And he said, we don't like to see Beethoven conduct, conducted by somebody's ass because he was jumping around so much, Stokowski. <laughs> So I mean that human makes Bonar human, you know. I mean, it's, I mean they were funny people. They made jokes like everybody else. And it was a wild time. I mean, I that thing with Soutine. I mean, he his story is more like punk rocker, you know, than it is anything else. You know, it's it's like it's old, real you know, Bohemia. And, and, you know, Bohemia didn't leave. I experienced a bit of Bohemia like in the 80s. And Dennis, who's looking at this talk, was there too, where we would, you know, like go to a, a bar like Puffy's Bar all the way downtown. And we would stay there till the sun came up. Because in those days in New York, you had, a bar had to close a couple hours a day, but they could choose the hours. So they were open all night. So there is, you know, you can't keep doing that. 
and survive, but everybody, there's always pockets of Bohemia in the world. Andre, thank you so much. As always, you just bring so much intelligence and formality of, of your presentation. I just really enjoyed it. But I wanna talk about one painting in particular. And when we talk about the reaction to the painting with that soutine with the flayed rabbit, do you know which one I'm talking about? It's in the barns, it's on that side wall. And every time I walk past it, my breath goes to my throat. Am I the only one that feels that way about that poor little animal? That's an amazing painting. I know the painting you're talking about. It's splayed out. I know, I know, a lot of ochre. Yeah, he went for that stuff. I don't know, he was, he was a wild guy. He was, he was he, you're right, they're, 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 he's still shock. They're still shocking paintings. I mean, they really yeah. are. Yeah, you know what's funny? I, you're reminding me of something which I forgot to say. When, when Barnes brought those paintings, back to Philadelphia. The next year in 1923, he got them in a show at the Philadelphia Academy of Art. Can you imagine? <laughs> there was the, no, no wonder nobody wanted, and that's why nobody, no museum in, in Philadelphia wanted his paintings. And that's why he built his own you know, museum. Crazy. But he did sell off most of his, a lot of subpoenas, he did. Anyway, so if anybody, nobody else has anything to say, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dennis. He's somewhere. You still there? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Andre. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Enjoy. Thank you, George, too. Thank you. George, my brother. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Sun's out. Yes.